and I'd like to talk to you today about something that's been very dear to my heart and is an issue that all Australians from all political colours, no matter what party you support, would also agree on, and that's the issue of plastics in our marine environment. Recently I was up in the Great Barrier Reef with my family and within 20 metres either side of our towel, my children and I found 46 plastic bottle caps. We also collected a whole bag of rubbish. And then we went to the, the guard on duty and said, does anyone clean these beaches in the morning? And he said to me, we clean them every morning, but it doesn't matter what we do, by the next morning the beach is absolutely covered in plastic. And that's just one island in the middle of the Pacific. Marine plastics is one of the single biggest marine pollution issues in the world. For 40 years now, various conventions right around the world, including cooperation amongst all countries, have tried to address this problem. But the problem is only getting worse. I'd like to read you some basic statistics on the amount of plastics in the ocean. The amount of plastic produced from 2000 to 2010 exceeded, in those 10 years, the amount produced during the entire last century. Plastic is the most common type of marine litter found worldwide. An estimated 100,000 marine mammals and up to 1 million seabirds die every year after ingesting or being tangled in plastic marine litter. Up to 80 per cent of plastic in our oceans comes from land-based sources. Plastics compromise up to 90 per cent of all floating marine debris. Plastics do not biodegrade, but instead break down in what's called photodegrading into small particles that persist in the ocean, absorb toxins and enter our food chain through fish, seabirds and other marine life. I have a report here by Dr Jen Labus from CS CSIRO in Tasmania uh, looking particularly at short-tailed shearwaters, um, a uh, species of seabird endemic to Tasmania. Her, the conclusion of her research and others is that the ingestion of plastic was first reported in 1984 in these birds. Studies following that reported the frequency of plastic ingestion, so that's the amount of plastics inside these seabirds, to be around 85 per cent. However, recent data, uh, comprehensive scientific studies in 2011, show the proportion of population is now 100 per cent. So every bird tested has plastic in its body. We've also found plastic now inside plankton, the bottom of the food chain. Plastic is all through our ocean, and it's probably not unreasonable to say that certainly parts of the ocean, such as the, the, the Pacific Gyre, have turned into a plastic soup. Now, I just wanted to focus on that issue of land-based sources for plastic. Uh, recently, on a uh, current affair, uh, sorry, not on a current affair, on um, Catalyst, I'll get to current affair in a minute, um, Dr Britta Denise Hardesty from CSIRO said, observationally, we do not find full plastic bottles or cans or glass bottles in South Australia. And I would like to attribute that to the container deposit scheme that they have there. The waste that's associated with the beverage industry comprises about a third, and some estimates are as high as half of all marine debris that we find globally. So that's bottles and cans and straws and disposable coffee cups. Bring your own cup to the beach with you. Now, people say, how do we solve this marine plastics problem? Well, it's not going to be solved very easily. The place to start is in raising awareness that this is actually a serious issue through education and through action. For years I've been involved with volunteer organisations cleaning beaches right around the country. I've also been fortunate enough to visit Tasmania's remote southwest where with four fishing boats we removed four and a half tonnes of marine plastic off three beaches. Four and a half tonnes of marine plastic. And that occurs every year through the hard work of some Tasmanians such as uh, Matthew Dell. Now, what can we do as parliamentarians? 
It's our role, and I see it as our duty, to look at effective policy prescriptions for such a problem. And one thing that's been talked about for years without any action is a container deposit legislation scheme or a container deposit scheme. Recently, uh, I was given a touch-up on a current affair by the uh, Australian Food and Grocery Council, uh, a lady called Jenny Pickles in particular, who was criticising the Greens for wanting to bring in a great big new plastic tax. You heard that line before. Unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to respond in kind, but I would have pointed out that it's actually a deposit scheme that the majority of Australians support. It isn't a tax. It is simply a payment or an incentive for people to do the right thing, and that is return rubbish to be effectively recycled. Now, it is implemented in South Australia, where, as I mentioned earlier, evidence shows that it has helped reduce, reduce marine debris, which is a serious problem in our ecosystems, and it is operational in the Northern Territory. Why isn't it operation, operational in other parts of the country and, indeed, other countries around the world? I get asked this question all the time. If this scheme works and it does help reduce the amount of litter and debris, why hasn't it been implemented? The key reason is going back to Jenny Pickles and her group, the Australian Food and Grocery Council. The leader of the pack in companies lobbying to prevent container deposit legislation is none other than Coca-Cola and a number, a number of other uh, beverage companies. Coke, through various means, not just in Australia but also internationally, has had the funds to run a very effective lobbying campaign to prevent them having to put their hands in their pockets to help clean up what is fast becoming a major or is already a significant global pollution problem and a threat to marine life. The Boomerang Alliance claim that this is purely ideological. They're a company that doesn't like being told what to do. They believe in free market and they don't believe in government regulations. Well, I've got a lot of specific examples of exactly the lengths in this country that Coca-Cola and other companies in the packaging industry have gone to to prevent things such as container deposit legislation. During the parliamentary debate, as an example, introducing CDL into the Northern Territory in February this year, Coke and its allies mounted an expensive media advertising and political campaign against the legislation. Coke were eventually accused by the NT Chief Minister of running a misleading public campaign and told to desist with their lies. Coke are now threatening to take legal action against the Northern Territory government. Another example. During the 2005 WA Labor government, sorry, during the 2005, the then WA Labor government considered introducing a container deposit scheme. The government pulled back due to reported threats of Coke running a marginal seat campaign against the party. This meant campaigning against sitting Labor Party MPs in electorates where the race was tight thereby threatening the Labor government with a losing power. But this is not just something specific to, to beverage companies. There's an enormous amount of literature on lobbying campaigns in places like the US against the introduction of things such as plastic bags. So I'd like to get on record that I use plastic. Plastic is probably one of the best inventions of the last century in terms of the benefits that it's brought our society, and those benefits are undoubtedly immense. However, only human beings can produce a product that nature can't recycle, and that product is plastic. For our own benefits, we've created a monster. And it makes a lot of sense that, given our capacity and our intelligence as a species, we can now look at what we can do to reduce plastic production 
and invest in schemes, incentives, technologies to replace plastic, especially single-use plastics. So, going back to public education and what people can do to help with the problem of plastics in the ocean, we can reuse, recycle, reduce especially the use of single-use plastics, which is everywhere in terms of our supermarkets. You can also volunteer to get involved with local community groups in beach cleanups and remove debris from beaches. And I'd like to say that's one of the big advantages of a container deposit legislation. This idea that producer responsibility is unfair on producers, apart from the fact it flies in the face of classic economics that producers should be responsible for the externalities of the products they produce. The beauty about CDL is it actually includes consumer responsibility and puts the onus on consumers to return bottles and take action. So apart from cleaning beaches and getting involved in local campaigns to recycle plastics, CDL actually forces consumers to do the right thing and it forces companies to do the right thing. And this is something that Australia could show some significant international leadership on. Now, the whole movement towards educating the public on global plastics, as I mentioned, has been in train for nearly 40, 50 years, since we started discovering plastic turning up in our ocean. The Southern Pacific Gyre, where probes down to 200 metres have uncovered solid plastic in the ocean, 200 metres under the surface, was discovered by Captain Charles Moore, a Coast Guard captain from the US. He's now been given an honorary doctorate and he's arriving in Australia next week. He has dedicated his life now to educating the world on marine plastics and the dangers that marine plastics uh, pose to our ecosystem. He'll be speaking in a public speaking circuit around the country next week and the following week, and then he'll be going around the world. In conjunction with his talks on the dangers of marine plastic and how we can combat this problem is the filming of a movie called Trashed, the first global documentary to highlight the issue of marine plastics in our environment. To quote Charlie Moore, if I could call him Charlie Moore, the world must be convinced to cease using its oceans as the final resting place for its waste. The Plastic Pollution Conversation, which is the name of his global tour, must continue with an even louder voice, says Moore. My vision is to increase the volume of that voice in a fundamental rethinking of the plastic age and the associated growing global health crisis. Education, awareness is going to be very important, but we have a special ability in parliament, in both federal parliament and state parliaments, to implement a policy scheme that can begin to address frightening facts that a third, for example, a third of all plastics in the ocean that break down into millions of pieces all the way down the food chain to plankton are from beverage containers. Now, Tangaroa Blue is a fully funded government body that's doing a lot more data research on marine plastics, and as our database increases, we get much better understanding of just what type of plastics we have in the ocean and where the sources are of those plastics, and that work will continue as well. And I just urge uh, fellow senators to take, this inter take interest in this subject because it's going to become a very important issue into the future. Thank you, Senator Wishwells.